Welcome back to the Agora Cafe for more coffee and philosophy. I'm pleased to have today my friend Nira Badwar, uh, who is Professor Emerita of Philosophy at the University of Oklahoma, Affiliate Faculty in Philosophy at George Mason University, a Senior Fellow in the F.A. Hayek Advanced Studies Program in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center. She's the author of Wellbeing, Happiness in a Worthwhile Life from Oxford University Press. That's her most recent book. Uh, she also wrote, Is Virtue Only a Means to Happiness? An Analysis of Virtue and Happiness in Ayn Rand's Writings from the Atlas Society uh, a while back. Uh, and she also edited uh, Friendship, a Philosophical Reader with uh, Cornell University Press. So, uh, hi, Nira. Uh, uh, it seems like I've known you for ages, but I don't really know that much about your background. And so I think that I, and perhaps my reader, my viewers would be curious to hear uh, some of your story. Thanks, Roderick. Thanks for having me. Um, so you want me to start with the buffalo? Sure. <laughs> okay. So my first memory is of this huge house in Ambala, which is in North India, north of Delhi. Um, I thought the ceilings were the highest ceilings I'd ever seen, and it just seemed huge to me, but I'm sure that if I went back to it now, it wouldn't seem that big. Um, and in our backyard... Sophia, probably. Sorry? You hadn't been to Hagia Sophia, probably. Oh, I have. <laughs> yes, but much later. I hadn't been. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it was a like Victorian bungalow that the British must have built for themselves. And then my dad had joined the army when the war broke out. So he got it. He was a Lieutenant Colonel or Lieutenant Colonel as Americans would say. So he got this lovely house until uh, we moved out of Ambala, whereupon he got another lovely house. <laughs> so anyway, in the backyard, there was a water buffalo that used to give I don't know if, I seem to remember my mother saying 16 gallons, but I don't think that can be right. Anyway, it was a lot of milk. And every evening, it, the buffalo was milked twice a day. And in the evening, my mother would take out the cream from the milk and turn it into butter. Uh, she had an English cream separator. And I remember standing there with a spoon and eating spoonfuls of pure cream. <laughs> When my grandmother lived with us, she would churn it the old fashioned way into butter. Um, I also have a vivid memory of a monkey snatching my dress when I stepped out one day. And that was terrifying. I don't know if people had to come and rescue me or if it just uh, ran away by itself. And we had little uh, chicks or eggs. I don't remember ever seeing hens killed from, from the meat, but they probably were. I'm glad I don't remember that part. And every now and then a peacock would appear and spread its plumage when it rained. That inspired me to write a short story for my son when he was little. Um, so that's my background. We left, uh, I, I changed six different schools because my dad was all, always getting transferred out. And even after he left the army, he changed jobs a few times. And that was quite traumatic for me, leaving my friends behind. But I think I survived the trauma. Yeah, I, I, I changed a lot during childhood too. I lived all over the, the country. Different schools. Why were you changing schools so often? Each, uh, each move had its own reason. There wasn't a, a non-reductive reason for all of them. But I lived in California, Arizona, Colorado, Idaho. Oh, OK. But it, the, 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 one, the, the one good thing about that is that it helps, I mean, apart from just you know, the experience of it is, it, it's easier for me to remember, you know, what you know? What year or what range of years something happened? Because when I live, oh yeah, you know, we live for a long time in the same place, and I can't remember. I knew it was sometime in that period. So Auburn's the lo the longest I've ever lived anywhere. So it's harder for me to remember 
what the heck happened when here? Whereas if I only yeah. lived like, you know, like, you know, four years in New Hampshire, then if something happens that I remember New Hampshire, then I know it happened during that period. So it's, it's useful. Um, four years in New Hampshire when you were a kid? Yeah, well, that was for high school. Oh, okay. But that's a beautiful state to be in. So were all the others. Yeah, that's true. So how did you end up coming to North America? How did you get interested in philosophy and and or libertarianism and or Rand and the various and, and the Aristotelian ethics thing or your various interests? Well, I discovered We the Living uh, in my second year in college. I was 17. And a friend of mine who was sitting next to me was reading it in class. That's what we did. These two friends and I would just chat or read novels in our political science class. Uh, we just had no interest in what was going on and what was being taught. So I read We the Living and it was as though I finally found my alter ego, except that Kira was a much better person than I. And I told myself, okay, so you've got one year. She's 18 in the book and I'm 17. So I have one year to catch up. Um, and then after that, I read The Fountainhead and I thought, oh, I can't live here any longer. I can't live in this country. I have to go to America somehow. And then I read Atlas Shrugged. Um, and by that time I was married. I got married when I was 18. Uh, so I didn't really know how my dream was going to be realized. Oh, it would have been okay had Rand not said at the, at the end of Atlas Shrugged, she says, no one can tell me that the kind of people I've written about don't exist. The fact that this book has been written and published shows that they do. I think she was just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> if it hadn't been for that, I wouldn't have, you know, cast everything aside and flown across to America to find people like that. You thought that America was a country full of daggy taggarts? Well, not full of, but that there would be some. And I have to say that um, over the years, I've come to question what Rand regards as the virtue of some of her heroes. I don't think, I don't think all the things they do are right. And certainly not all the attitudes are right. Like for example? Well, in Atlas Shrugged, there are at least two places and Hank Reardon says to Dagny, in effect, why would I do anything for you? I'm doing it because it's good for me. And Dagny agrees. And that's totally ridiculous. Why can't he do something for her that's all? That because it is good for her is good for him. Yeah, so well, that's given her connection to Aristotelianism, she ought to have been able to recognize the idea that that yeah. the rest can be part of yours. Yeah. Promoting them can be part of promoting yours. Yeah, but also I think what is primary in a case like that is the other person's good. It's not as though you're looking for some way to benefit yourself and, oh, I could do this. Yeah, it's no, not for a strategy. You, it's like, yeah, it's, how can I best advance my interests? Oh, here's the person interaction with whom will, will promote my psychological health or something like that. Um, yeah, that's not. Yeah. But also I think it's primary. The other person's needs are sometimes primary, but if we love them, then in meeting them, we also benefit ourselves. After all, if Dagny didn't need his help, then he wouldn't have done it right. So it all turns on what Dagny needs at that time. Mm -hmm. And it's sad, but a lot of objectivists think that that is the truth in her view, that for every act, you have to be able to say that it was good for you and that's why you did it. Well, they, they need more Aristotle. 
Yes, and common sense. Because commonsensically, we know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so, you know, there you are in India, you're uh, thinking about America. Uh, what happens? So what happens is that, thanks to Carter, the airlines are deregulated and the price, the fares go down drastically. And I realized that I have 5,000 rupees in my bank. My parents gave me 5,000 rupees when I got married, in addition to lots of other things like gold jewelry and kitchen stuff and clothes and whatnot. And that was the cost of a ticket. <laughs> so I said, I'm going. And uh, after a lot of resistance, my ex-husband said, okay, and my son went to live with my mother. He was very, very close to her. And I said I was going for four months because that was, my return ticket was for four months. But at the, at the airport, the immigration um, person asked me how long I wanted to stay in America. And I didn't know that it was, that I could choose a longer period. So I think I said, six months or one year, but then I just continued and I was away for one year and nine months altogether, which was not great for my son. And I do wish I had not stayed away for that long, but here we are. This is what objectivism does to you. <laughs> so when I went back, some objectivists said to me, oh, but why are you going back? If you can stay here, you should stay. This is what you want to do. I said, no, I have a son back home. Well, why is his happiness more important than your own? Oh, for Christ's sake. There it is again, yeah. Yeah, I mean, don't you even recognize obligations? Even if it wasn't, even if it didn't make me happy to go back. I, I couldn't have been happy if I'd stayed on, abandoning my child. But even if that was not the case, I had an obligation to go back. Oh, and then, well, so that Rand got me interested in philosophy, of course. But at the same time, in one of her essays, she made fun of contemporary philosophy and made it sound as though it was, you know, there's no point in studying it. So I didn't think of studying it for a long time, but till I went to, till I started auditing Harry Benzwanger's course on philosophy of mind, or I think he called it philosophical psychology at Hunter College. And on the very first day, everything fell into place. And I knew what I really wanted to study and why I hadn't been wholehearted about my, about political science. I got an MA in political science while I was in New York and why I hadn't been wholehearted about my BA in English literature back in India. So as soon as I went back, I enrolled in the MA program in philosophy at Pune University. And, uh... So then how did you end up uh, here eventually? I got admission uh, to the University of Toronto to do a, PhD, to do a PhD. And uh, a friend of mine in New York very generously deposited $5,000 in my bank account in Toronto because Canadian immigration said I couldn't go with a child without some kind of financial support. Uh, and the department said that they would give me a teaching assistantship. So on the basis of those things, I managed to get out. I have to, I took my son without, without telling his dad because earlier he had agreed to my taking him and then he had changed his mind. So I didn't think I owed him that bit of information. So that was it. And then I got the job at the University of Oklahoma. 
Um, and then in 2009, after I got married to Larry and he got a job here in Fairfax, I took a year's leave and came with him and realized I could not, I either had to go live in Norman or give up my job. Since I wasn't willing to go live in Norman again, I just gave up my job. You may want to tell my viewers may not all know who Larry White is. He's a little bit about. Oh, no, he's my husband. He's an economist. And he teaches at George Mason University. And he does a lot of work on money and gold and Bitcoin. Free banking stuff. Free banking. But now he's writing a book on Bitcoin and the gold standard. Yeah, cool. So what have your interactions been like with uh, you know, the broader Randian community? I don't really have any interactions with them. I don't haven't met any in uh, Fairfax. Um, and I don't go to DC much. Well, when I do go is to see my family. Um, yeah, I sometimes look at their um, little videos, draw my life. The latest is Draw My Life, Bernie Sanders. Have you seen any of them? I don't think so. Oh, they're yeah. quite fun, actually. Yeah. Uh, so I think the text is provided by uh, the CEO. Um, oh my God, I'm blanking on her name. I do know her name, and I, I have met her. She's wonderful. Um, yeah. One of them was on Ayn Rand. I draw my life, Ayn Rand. Well, this does sound vaguely familiar. I think mm -hmm. uh, maybe I saw some of those a while ago. Um, yeah. I don't remember. I'm just going to get her name one minute. I think that'll take me out of Zoom, but I'm not sure. Oh, here. Ah. Uh, you you can you can look at other other pages and still be as long as you don't close Zoom you just yeah okay so you can still see me. you'll you'll still yeah. be you know, I I can still see you even if you're looking at your oh I see okay. Okay. Yeah. I've I've been having to learn more and more about Zoom uh, uh -huh. given the the current unpleasantness, although uh, it's had some, uh, you know, it's been useful, you know, because I, for example, I'm part of a science fiction reading group that used to just meet uh, here in Auburn and it was a science fiction philosophy reading group. And although it was nice to meet in person and we'd go out to dinner afterward, uh, and now we meet on Zoom and we can't do that. But on the other hand, we can, we, we invite people. Yeah. Places who are not here and so that you know that's a, a plus so it comes with pluses and minuses yeah how often do you meet you yeah, once a month once every two months depending on how much we get our act together yeah oh okay jennifer grossman okay jennifer grossman yeah all right i'll put i'll put a link to that in the description now usually any, you know, anything i talk about i put a link to in the description so i'll have a link i'll have a link to um uh to your books in okay. the description and then i'll have a look to this uh the jennifer grossman writing my life uh, yeah she's not uh i mean of course she respects rand but she's not like reverential in her attitude um oh no <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, David Kelly isn't either, so that's not all that surprising. Yeah, I think I think his his book. Um, well, it was uh, it's it was it's been titled. It had various titles. It's kind of gone through a few different uh, editions. But his book on on the contested oh, right. legacy of Ayn Rand or Truth and Toleration or whatever the latest edition is. Oh titled, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I still think that's a very nice book. Uh, yeah. Well, I have a blurb on the back 
saying that oh. it, on some edition or other. Yeah. Uh, okay. Hey, I'll, I'll stick that in the in okay. the whatever. Yeah. So, what are you working on these days? Well, I just finished this article on virtue ethics and libertarianism for Matt Solinsky and Ben Ferguson's anthology. And we were supposed to write about, write about the work done in this area by other people instead of trying to advance a novel thesis. Uh, I thought at first it would be a bit tiresome, but it wasn't actually because it, <laughs> there were only four philosophers who had defended libertarianism on virtue, ethical foundations. So there was plenty of time to reflect on what they had said and come up with my own views. Um, so the four people, you know all the four people that I'm talking about, and I think you know one of them quite intimately. You might be able to guess who that is? Well, there's the, the, uh, the, descri the uh, inscription at Delphi, know thyself. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so, so the presumption is that that's something difficult to do. So. Uh, what? Knowing yourself. Yes. So perhaps you shouldn't assume that I, I'm so successful in that particular endeavor. <laughs> so anyway, one thing I realized that I hadn't realized before, maybe this is something that everyone knows and I'm the only one who didn't know it, but I don't think so. So one thing I realized in trying to write this paper is that if you try to defend individual rights in terms of a highly moralized conception of human life, such as the fact that human beings pursue virtue or eudaimonia. So human beings need freedom in order to pursue virtue or eudaimonia and eudaimonia. Um, you end up excluding a lot of people from the status of rights bearers because many, many people do not pursue virtue across the board. They might do, they might, they, I think they do pursue it in some areas of their lives, like with people they love or like, but not across the board. Um, so then instead of trying to justify rights in terms of people's pursuit of virtue, some philosophers try to justify them in terms of people's moral capacity. But even this leaves out a lot of people. Uh, for example, antisocial personalities who repeatedly inflict emotional harm on others, but don't violate other people's rights. And psychopaths who do the same out of a lack of empathy, remorse, and guilt. So antisocial personalities might have some moral capacity, but they don't really exercise it often. Uh, whereas psychopaths lack the capacity altogether. At the same time though, at least in one case, uh, the psychopath has done some really worthwhile work. <clears throat> He's a neuroscientist who's won awards for his work. Um, so I guess he has at least an intellectual virtue, namely the pursuit of truth. But the more general lesson that I draw. I think hmm? my grandmother might have been either a sociopath or a psychopath. I don't know. You know, the did, she have any, did she do anything worthwhile in her life or no? Yeah, no, she was she was a brilliant, charming person who very innovative. Um, you know, she had many virtues, but uh, deeply manipulative, deep lack of empathy. Um, uh, what kind of virtues did she have if she was deeply manipulative and without empathy? Well, I'm using virtues in sort of the in the broad sense of like, well, the virtue of my theory is, you know, so she had, you know, she had, she had positive features. So the positive features were that she, you know, things like, you know, intelligence, ingenuity, creativity, um, uh, stuff like that. So not exactly moral virtues. Yeah, uh, more like intellectual or craft virtues. Yeah. So like, what did she do uh, in which these, 
qualities were displayed? Well, um, uh, she, you know, as, as soon as she married my grandfather, she, you know, she, uh, you know, quit working. She'd been working as a, uh, as a secretary, but she, um, uh, uh, she had, uh, at one point she was, uh, uh, she did some uh, speaking on the radio. Uh, people found, and, and, and they invited her to, to become a regular speaker on the radio because uh, she was very engaging and, and so forth on the radio. Oh, yeah. But she couldn't, she turned down because she couldn't stick to a, you know, she said, oh, I couldn't possibly stand a regular schedule of having to come in periodically and, and talk. Um, she came up with, uh, you know, various things in the way of sort of household design. She came up with some way of, of, um, of mixing uh, dye into the, uh, tiles of the patio that was innovative and, uh, that kind of thing. She did some, uh, you know, some painting, um, uh, she was very athletic. Um, you know, as a as a young girl, she would, uh, you know, she would, uh, you know, outrace all the boys in bicycles. Um, <laughs> and uh, later, as an adult, she would, you know, she was really good at sort of you know, hiking and climbing around mountains, and huh. uh, which my mother was not. Um, uh, and she was a very expert driver as long as there were no other drivers around. But if there were other drivers around, she would fly into a rage at them and take both hands off the wheel and shake her fists at them. And so, and do uh, what off the wheel? Yes. Uh, what did you say? She would what? She would take both hands off the wheel and shake her fists at the other drivers and yell at them. Uh, and so her husband wouldn't let her drive. Yeah. He, he was the opposite. He was a very slow careful driver careful except that he would never look back he would never even look in the rear view mirror he would just drive yeah. very slowly uh my mother used to compare them to the irresistible force and the immovable object um but they were both kind of held to live with in, in different ways um so it looks like you spent a lot of time with her hmm. Uh, and a lot of my, I mean, I, I knew her, but a lot of my stories about her are from my mother. But yeah, she, okay. but she lived with us for a while, and so I got to experience. Uh, she lived with you and your mother. Yeah. Wow. Yes. <laughs> it was, uh, yeah, toward the end you of her life. After, uh, after she was widowed or what? Yeah. Um, and she was, let's say she was difficult to live with. She went around the uh, this was in, in New Hampshire. She went around the town telling people that my mother was starving her to death, uh, which was not strictly accurate. <laughs> Did she look starved? She was very thin, uh, but but strong and wiry. Um, even you know, even in her you know, latest or feeblest uh, uh, old age, she had a kind of wiry strength that you you, know, you wouldn't expect. How old was she when she died? She died, she was around the same age that my mother was when she died, 91, 92, something like that. Oh, okay. Um, How did she treat her husband? Uh, very badly. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, she sort of, you know, she, she tormented both him and my mother and made their lives miserable. And then on his deathbed, she forged his signature on the will to make all the money go to her and not to uh, his kids. Um, but if they discovered the forgery, why didn't they disregard? Um, they didn't discover the forgery. Uh, you, know, you know, my mother was there in the room, but at the time she was sort of too cowed by my mother to, to do anything about it. Um, uh, so my mother, so my grandmother basically controlled my mother for the rest of her life by doling out little bits and bits of, uh, of the money that she should have inherited. Yeah. Uh, which is. Oh, this is while she was still living at home. 
yeah. with her mom. Yeah. Yeah, my mother didn't actually leave home until uh, uh, until she was thirty, uh, because her, her her mother kept guilting her about, oh, you can't leave, I can't get on without you. Although she was perfectly you know, she was perfectly competent, but she'd say things like, well, I can't change my typewriter ribbon. You're the only one who can change it, and and my mother would, my mother would actually fall for that. But eventually, she you know, they, they were living in San Francisco at the time. My mother finally left in a burst of, you know combination of guilt and liberatory elation and drove down to LA where her mother told her you'll never be able to get a job in LA you're the, the her parents both used to call her non compass mentis they said she was incapable of surviving on her own even though she'd gotten you know, excellent grades in school that it didn't matter to yeah her. but she grandfather was, your grandfather also abused your mother yes uh, you know again both you know, emotionally not physically um, yeah. Her brother was the physically abusive one. That's a whole other story. Um, but anyway, they told her, oh, she, you'll never be able to survive on your own. But she did. She got down to LA. She uh, you know, got a job just fine. Um, uh, and, but later on, you know, periodically, you know, they, by, uh, you know, after my mother was widowed, we, we would occasionally live with, with, with my grandmother on and off. One time, Oh, my grandmother also, my mother used to, to write letters uh, to my grandmother about me, about me growing up. And my grandmother, who was sort of fond of me, uh, would say, oh, I'll always keep these letters, cherish them. And one time she was mad at my mother and she just tore all the letters up in front of me. There were no copies. This is also around the time when, um, when my grandmother claimed that she had injured her leg and so my mother had to drive her everywhere because she couldn't walk anywhere because she, but one day my mother happened to see her striding freely down the street because she didn't know my mother was watching so anyway she was a handful <laughs> it seems to be more about me than about you now <laughs> the interviewer has become the interviewee yeah i just but uh anyway going back getting back to your point which i led off into this digression about sociopaths and psychopaths and whether yeah. they're, I mean, that's, this kind of issue is part of the reason why uh, I prefer to think of uh, the commitment to liberty not so much as a need on the part of the uh, recipient, uh, right. and a need on the part of the the rights respecter. Um, that um, uh, it's just inherently you know, more human, more humane, more civilized to deal with people by a reason and cooperation rather than by force. And so that's something yeah. that's incumbent on you as an agent, uh, even if the people you're dealing with are, you know, not, you know, not responding to it as uh, appropriately as, uh, as they should. Yeah, but the question then arises, well, why is it more humane, more civilized or whatever? What is it about the other person that makes it what something I ought to do? Well, I mean, they are, you know, they are rational agents and they are, as long as they're human beings, even if they're behaving in a very defective manner, it's still true that the rationality is sort of the deepest and most explanatory. Okay, fact. so it's capacity for reason. Yeah. That. Yeah, even, you know, uh, even, that grounds rights and shows why rights are important. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yeah, so that's fine. But um, are these people rational? Psychopaths? Sometimes. Well, I mean, the term rational can mean both having the capacity for it and exercising it. Uh, yeah. And of course, everyone, has, you know, everyone has that capacity exercises it to some degree. You know, everyone uses rationality to some degree, uh, there are obviously various differing degrees of it, um, yeah. and you know, probably no one uses it, you know, uses it as fully as in principle they could. Um, yeah. So yeah, well, I think in the case of some people, like real serious psychopaths, um, without any redeeming intellectual. Uh, features. I think the only reason 
we have to respect their rights is because the alternative is some people deciding which people don't have the capacity. Um, and that can, that's risky because you might be mistaken. And if you're talking about the state deciding, well, then the state, then that's giving the state too much power. Um, and why bother locking them up anyway if they're not violating anyone's rights? Well, you might say, but they're making people's lives a misery. Um, and then standard libertarian answer would be, well, but they can move away. You know, they can get rid of them. But, you know, that's not always easy. Right. So they are doing damage, but they're not doing the kind of damage that deprives them of rights. Uh, I think one can only give practical reasons for not depriving them of their rights. Well, I like to think of it in terms of, you know, evils that involve force should be combated with, or can be combated, not necessarily should, but can be combated with force. And evils that don't involve force shouldn't be combated with force, should be combated by other means. That doesn't mean, as people sometimes think, that evils that don't involve force are always less serious. Than no, no, I agree. I, know, I think that, you know, what my grandmother did to my mother was more serious than you know uh you know someone giving you a quick punch and then running off with your wallet uh yeah. i think they you know, um uh but you know so it's not the degree of harm it's the kind uh it's the kind of interaction um yeah and i and i completely agree i might have probably said that somewhere too but the thing is it's I mean, we say, okay, you can always go away, but you can't always go away, especially if you're a child. No, and of course, um, well, yeah, and the issue of children's rights is complicated because, you know, it's one thing to be doing the, you know, to be inflicting this kind of misery on an adult, which of course at the end my, my grandmother was, since my, as I said, my mother was 30 by the time she left. So, but yeah. if you talk about, um, you know, it's a difficult question. Uh, about you know what kind of intervention is permissible in the case of of you know emotional not physical but emotional yeah. abuse of children where it seems like whatever whatever policy you could come up with is probably going to have either you know either too many interventions or too few yeah. uh, you know, so that's that's going to be a difficult question well not just for libertarians I think it's a difficult question for you know for anyone on any yeah. On any view. Well, but maybe it's more difficult for libertarians. Yeah. Because other people are quite open to excuse me, having the state intervene. However, they don't seem to realize the dangers of doing that. So maybe it's just as difficult for them. Of course, libertarians have had a, a broad range of views on this topic. Because one end, of, you've got like, you know, Murray Rothbard saying that children are their parents' property, although since he also says that parents shouldn't be allowed to kill them, he doesn't quite mean property. You think he's being sloppy there. But anyway, he says that that um that you know that children are completely subject to their, to their parents' authority until they rebel and then suddenly they require rights. So that, that's a sort of odd view. Regardless of the age. Yeah. So it seems like it's you know it's, it's you know it swings from too much to one direction to too much to the other. Um, yeah. But, you know, it's a, uh, you know, but it is a difficult question. Um, I think that, you know, despite people sometimes saying, you know, including people in the Randian movements, and they're saying, well, all that matters is, is force. I mean, if you look at the, um, uh, if you look at, for example, uh, the Fountainhead, uh, most of the people who get victimized in the mountainhead uh, are not victimized by literal force. They're victimized by various kinds of social pressure. Uh, yeah. Individuals and the way that Ellsworth Toohey sort of manipulates his niece, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, twists her, her soul into a pretzel. Um, and then also it's sort of broader social forces for the way that people like, um, uh, Rourke's mentor, Henry Cameron, or the sculptor, Steve Mallory, and all these people are uh, 
you know, are so, you know, deeply, uh, you know, deeply oppressed, not by the actual use of force, but by a, a, a social milieu, um, which Rourke is able to overcome, but, uh, uh, but, you know, Rourke is, you know, is, is a kind of unique growth upon the earth. Um, you know, the, a what? Unique what? A unique growth upon the earth. I mean, in his, in his complete psychological uh, independence. And we, did, we learned very much, we learned very little about his childhood. Sometimes, with some of the characters, we learn a lot about their childhoods, but Rourke, we don't. It's like he, you know, he grew up out of the yeah. ground or <laughs> sprang from Zeus's brow. Um, uh, unlike, um, uh, you know, with Gail Winand. Yeah, you know, Gail Winand, we learn his whole, the whole details of his child. Yeah. She very and, she does that so well. I mean, as, as the creator of the character, she actually has sympathy for him. And she's no, trying actually, to tell And I find the, the description of Tui's childhood, I find interesting too. Uh, Tui is her most interesting villain. Um, and, and the only villain that I'd want to have coffee with <laughs> uh, yeah, in her book. So you got, can you imagine having, you know, having coffee with James Taggart? I can't imagine what, what we'd talk about. Uh, um, but you know, too, it'd be interesting. I mean, you know, he wouldn't be my top choice to have coffee with, but you know, if I pick one of the Ayn Rand villains to have coffee with, he'd be the one. Um, at least his conversation would be interesting. Uh, but um, uh, but yeah, anyway, so my point was that uh, these, um, uh, you know, that the Fountainhead very much illustrates the way in which, in which forces of, of oppression, whether personal or social, that don't involve the initiation of force, uh, you know, can still wreck people and mess people up. And you could say, yeah. well, they could all be like Howard Rourke and just, you know, show this kind of psychological independence. But we never see how work developed that kind of independence. Yeah. Uh, we don't know anything about his, his background or his childhood. Um, uh, and, you know, developing that kind of independence isn't, you know, isn't easy. Yeah. So the other thing I've uh, done recently is, uh, well, I guess it's not the other thing. Um, it's still, so I've been doing a little bit of political philosophy and business ethics in the last few years. Um, oh. and a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper on self-ownership and the course of writing it, I realized that unlike most libertarians, I think that sometimes violating a person's rights is justified or at least more justified than not violating them. For example, if my son or brother or a close friend were threatening to commit suicide because they'd been abandoned by their lover, I would stop them from killing themselves because I know they would get over it. Or I know that once they had recovered, they would have a happy life. Um, so first of all, do you agree that most libertarians would disagree with that? Yeah, I think that most would disagree. Although I remember that John Hospers took the same position you're taking. Oh, okay. Um, it, does he have an article on rights or what? Um, I can't remember where he says it, um, but he does. You know, he does say it. But I think, I think he draws distinction between that kind of you know, like temporary paternalism versus a uh, paternalistic regime that sort of prevents someone from committing suicide ever. Um, I can't remember if he draws that distinction or whether I'm just imagining that he should have. Yeah. So I better not hang out with you because if I wanted to commit suicide, you wouldn't stop me, right? Well, uh, you know, I don't know if my views are completely settled on this. I think that, um, uh, um, Uh, you know, I can certainly feel the pull of thinking that a, uh, you know, 
a temporary intervention to make sure that the person's really in there in yeah. their uh, you know fully in their right senses and is and that this is a you know a genuine long term commitment I think that could be you know i still i always i feel the pull of thinking that could be justified on the other hand, the idea that when someone has a long term settled decision to commit suicide, I just find yeah. it horrific that they should be prevented from doing it. Have you seen the movie Million Dollar Baby? No. So in that movie, um, it's sort of spoiler alert, but in, the, uh, in that movie, the, um, the main character gets uh, paralyzed from the neck down. Yeah. One of the two main characters gets paralyzed from the neck down and wants to die and cannot commit suicide and, um, and no one wants to uh, wants to help her, but she wants to die. And it's not just a yeah. temporary feeling; it's a permanent one. And the idea that you couldn't, you know, the idea that your life and your body could become a you know a cage that you could not escape, uh, yeah. Really yeah. terrifying. I mean, the, the, you know, yeah. there are, the, the Stoics are right with the idea of suicide as a as an escape that someone has a uh, has a right yeah. right to me. I would never stop someone in that position. Um, there's a wonderful movie based on a true story of a man in somewhere in Europe, forgetting the title, who is paralyzed and is being looked after by his brother and sister-in-law, mostly sister-in-law, and he hates being dependent on her. So he plot plans for many years to commit suicide and finally with his friend's help, he's able to. Like each friend does something that is legal, um, but over, the overall result is that they help him to commit suicide, which is illegal. But the state can't prosecute any of them because no one did more than a fraction of the action that was necessary for him to die. Yeah, that's interesting. That, you know, that could make a that make an interesting legal case. We well, said it's a true story, so I guess maybe it did make an interesting. Yeah, I think it has C in the title, and that's all I can remember now. Oh, I saw a movie once that had C in the title. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then I've done some work uh, in business ethics, and I'm surprised to see how easily they talk about virtue. Um, most of them, I think, just mean doing the right thing. They're not thinking of the reasons why a person does the right thing. Yeah, virtue talk has become popular. Uh, yes. With the revival of Aristotelian ethics, but often it's very superficial. Yeah, but there are two economists, Eugenio uh, Bruni or Lugino Bruni and Robert Sugden. Uh, they have an article called Reclaiming Virtue Ethics for Economics. And they say that they, they have in mind Aristotelian virtues, although their list of virtues is not the same as Aristotle's, but they can be, they can be understood in terms of Aristotle's virtues. Yeah. Well, I mean, Aristotle's list could certainly be improved. Um. <laughs> uh, yeah. So they're saying these are the specifically business counterparts of the standard Aristotelian virtues. So enterprise and alertness, trust and trustworthiness, respect for partners' preferences, self-help, acceptance of competition, non-rivalry, universality, and stoicism about reward. However, when they come to acceptance of competition, they have to acknowledge that most business people don't like competition and do their best to kill it. According to Matt uh, Mitchell, um, about, so he's done surveys, about 60% of the business people he interviewed said, oh yeah, we believe in competition, but I think in America there's too much competition. <laughs> uh, people and, have too many choices, it's terrible. What? People have too many choices, it's, it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. and uh, yeah, they all acknowledged that they had taken help from the government. Um, so, the authors, Bruni and Sugden, acknowledge that 
most business people don't like competition. Um, and they do their best to kill it. But if that's true, then it follows that most of them don't have most of the other virtues either. For example, non-rivalry is the virtue of regarding others as potential sources of mutual benefit rather than rivals one must knock down in order to benefit oneself. But these people are not acknowledging <clears throat> that their competitors are a source of mutual benefit. Um, oh, in fact, they go on to say, non-rivalry is the virtue of understanding that free exchange is a positive sum, not zero sum, of taking pleasure in other people's success and acting accordingly. Um, people who use political means to kill competition do not have this virtue, at least vis-a-vis -vis their competitors. They also don't have the virtue of universality because that virtue is opposed to political favoritism, patronage, protectionism, and nepotism. Um, so I think the only way to judge the character of a business person, or for that matter, you know, anyone in the, in the public eye, is, um, is on the basis of biographies. But even biographies can be misleading. For example, Bert Folsom in The Myth of the Robber Barons makes uh, Rockefeller out to be this paragon of virtue. But Ron Chernow, who's written a more detailed biography of Rockefeller based on his letters and other papers, um, talks about his many virtues, but also talks about the way he tried to kill competition. In particular, there was a small company that was building a pipeline um, and Rockefeller went out of his way to destroy it. First, they started buying land that was in the path of the projected pipeline and still this little company managed to chug along. Um, they tried to get the government to stop it and didn't succeed there. And in the end, this little company managed to build a pipeline up a steep mountain and no one else had done that before them. And so people were full of praise for this company, but Rockefeller, no, he was angry. So that's not, he wasn't, he was pretty bad in some ways, but at the same time, he's a wonderful employer. Um, he was a great entrepreneur. He reduced the price of gasoline from 58 cents a gallon to eight cents in the process saving whales. Um, so, he did have a lot of virtues, but not. When Folsom and Rand both seem to have this idea that either someone is a, you know, is an economic entrepreneur and they're, you know, they're, um, uh, you know, they're just uh, earning their way through providing, you know, better services at lower cost, or they're a political entrepreneur and they're just earning their way through political favoritism, yeah. as though there weren't lots and lots of intermediate cases. Yeah. Um, including lots of people who, you know, initially won their wealth mostly through economic means, but then once they were in a position to buy political favors, then they went all in, yeah. uh, trying them to do to squash the competition. You know, it, the idea that, you know, that, uh, and, and Rand in particular seems to think that anyone who is virtuous and rational enough to, you know, to make a fortune on their own would be too virtuous and rational to try and increase it by political means, but that yeah. does not seem to hold up historically. Yeah. Um, well, Gail Wynand manages to build a thriving empire by his own efforts, but it's not really an empire worth having. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's, um, yeah, I think most people are mixed. They have but now Vanderbilt really was, in his uh, life as a business person, he really was completely decent. He did try to get government help, but he failed. But the only reason he tried is because the government was helping his competitors. So I think that's a different case from trying to get help when you have no, when no one else is trying to get it. Uh, but anyway, he was pretty amazing. I think he was, he did everything right in his business life. And J.J. Hill, the two of them. 
Yeah, I mean, I suspect on closer inspection that, you know, I at least would find problems. Um, but then I, you know, you know, I have these worries about sort of background conditions uh, created by government that sort of favor, uh, you know, favor uh, large firms and so forth. But, but that's another story. Um, Yeah, I don't think these guys became big uh, and survived because of any favors that were done to them. I well, not they... directly, but I, you know, I, I, I don't kind of think that that uh, you know some of the things like you know the um, uh, you know the kind of government interventions that made it harder for workers to organize and so forth, made it harder for independent workers co-ops and so forth to do things. Um, uh, the um, you know the kind of giveaways to the railroads, uh, which you know some may have benefited from more than others, but I think it helped to skew the whole economy uh, toward these you know, toward these large firms. I don't think these guys were competing on a you know, on a completely uh, you know, flat competition field. But JJ Hill didn't get any help. Uh, I mean, he was. He was trying to make a success of his business on the face of other businesses that were getting help. Right. So also, I don't know, I don't know how about his case to know whether I would have some criticism, although I bet I would if I, if I look closer. Um, you said something, I, we talked about this before, and you said something about the land, his not having to pay the full cost of the land because of some program that the government had. I don't, but I don't remember what that was. I don't remember either. Uh, my memory is not what it was. Uh, but in any case, I don't think everyone is responsible for everything that's gone before. I mean, look, we're teaching in, well, I used to teach in a state institution. You're teaching in a state institution, right? So how unjust does I'm that make talking to you on a on a laptop that was bought for me by a state institution. Uh, right. And my license for Zoom was, uh, for, the, you know, for the professional version of Zoom, uh, was paid for by a state institution. Oh, okay, there you are. So and that building, that building there was built by a state institution, namely, namely ancient Athens. Yeah. <laughs> and it's still, and it's still slave labor. And it's still owned by a state institution, right? Yes. So not slave labor so much these days. Uh, no. So that's, no. That's some, um, that's some improvement. Uh, yes. There's less, there's less slavery in Athens now than there was during its heyday. <laughs> There's no slavery there now, is there? There's, there's, there, there's probably something going on somewhere. Um, you know, people who are trapped in some kind of human trafficking or something somewhere in an even large city like that. There's, there's probably some kind of crap going on, but you know, it's not, uh, you know, not like, not like the old days. I don't think the old days when Pericles built the Parthenon, as they put it, uh, <laughs> all by himself. Did you say something just now? I said when Pericles built the Parthenon all by himself. Yeah, <laughs> all by himself, yes. But backtracking a little bit, I'm curious about what your reactions were to, you know, to America or, or Canada, uh, to North America generally. Uh, oh, so the first city I lived in was New York. Okay. And I felt as though I had stepped, I had leapfrogged over the 20th century and landed in the future because I'd never seen those kinds of buildings, except in movies, of course, but yeah. it's not the same thing. The difference. Uh, yeah. The difference from landing in, you know, I don't know, Cleveland or somewhere. Uh, yeah. Or Norman. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Norman, yeah. I was always looking up at the buildings. I was always getting lost. 
but people go on to four well, other stuff. Yeah, and ask in Manhattan, the grid structure is helpful for finding your way. The um, what structure? The grid structure, the streets and the avenues, the way they're laid out, as opposed to some cities where it's all. Yeah, that's true. Except, well, some cities uh, are very, very charming, but. Except in southern uh, Manhattan, there it gets topsy turvy. It does. Um, so anyway, I was always lost, but I would just ask for directions because I'm not a man. <laughs> People were very nice. Like even in the subway, I'm, you know, they're rushing to catch that train and I'm saying, I, I'm going to some such place, which train should I take? And they would show me. Uh, so yeah, that was uh, an amazing experience. And oh, the f actually, no, I landed in Washington, DC and stayed with a distant relative. And on my very first full day there in the evening, I asked uh, this distant cousin of mine to take me to uh, somewhere in Maryland where a group of objectivists was running Peacock's lectures on objectivism or something. Yeah, I heard I, back in the day. My primary aim was to you know, be with a group of objectivists and hear more about objectivism. So he dropped me there and at the end of the session, I turned around and if anyone could take me back to wherever it was we were staying, close to DC. And this couple said, yeah, we'll take you. Um, but then they said, would you like to come to our house first and then we'll take you back? I said, yeah, sure. And, and I just made friends with this couple. Um, and then I, then I said, look, I really want to go to Manhattan. And, but I don't know anyone there. Said, oh, we have a single friend. Uh, but he lives in a studio apartment, but we can ask him if you like. I said, yes, please. So they asked him and I stayed with him for about a week. And then he said his daughter was coming to visit him. The daughter lived somewhere else with her mother. He said, you can either share my bed with me or you can find another place for yourself. <laughs> I, said, <"I'm> <laughs> I said, I'll find another place. And by that time, I'd started working in an Indian boutique. So I told one of the women there that I needed a place. She said, oh, you can come and stay with me for a week. I said, OK. And then before that week was up, I met someone else. And she said, oh, you can come and stay with me as long as you like. <laughs> she was an objectivist. So I spent about a month with her. Then I found, by that time, I'd enrolled in uh, the New School for Social Research to get a degree in uh, political science. And, uh, and then I found an apartment to share with two other students. Oh, so this is, oh, apart from the guy who wanted you in his bed, this is, this is you, know, uh, you know, a more, a more friendly version of both objectivists and end of Manhattanites than people might expect. Yeah. <laughs> Well, even the guy who said that, you know, he said, look, I have no place. I said, yeah, I know. So <laughs> go look for a place. <laughs> yeah. Um, any thoughts on what's going on nowadays in India? Oh, terrible. It's terrible what's going on. People have just flipped under the influence of this evil man, Modi. All of a sudden, the ma Hindu majority seems to think that they have been oppressed all these years by Muslims. And so it's only just that Muslims should get revenge. I mean, that Hindus should get revenge on Muslims. And if you say, but look, these are not the same Muslims. I asked one of my relatives, I said, Oh, she asked me, why are Americans so, and so against Jews? I said, very few Americans are against Jews. But the real question is, why are so many Hindus against Muslims? And she says, oh, because they conquered us. I said, that was a long time ago. It was different people. It's not the people who are alive now. I know, but it doesn't matter. Even when they see the, the ridiculousness of their position, they don't care. And some people simply deny that anything is going on. 
no, that's just the media. Or they've started using the term false news, fake news. See, America's influence reaches far and wide. Yeah, well, there seems to be a kind of resurgence of nationalism around charismatics yeah. all over yeah. the world. Hungary, Poland, the US, India, but at least civil societies here is really strong. There's so many groups fighting against the kind of nonsense that Trump is uh, that Trump has let loose on us. Yeah, well, you know, you know, if it weren't for the um, you know the kind of structures of and people will say, you, know, you shouldn't be so anti-government, you should be grateful to government for providing you the freedom. But the, you know, the freedom is freedom that has been won against the government by the efforts of, of, you know, of people you know, over the decades, you know, wrenching every bit of freedom they could get from the government. So the idea that the government is here, you know, the government has just voluntarily chosen to limit and restrain itself is not you know, it's not that accurate yeah. um so you know we're lucky that there's been you know even though our government is not as restrained as it should be particularly from my point of view or to be restrained to yeah. uh, but um uh it's um you know it's it is restrained enough that um that someone like trump can't do as much damage as they could if they were you know you were just sort of the you know yeah really empowered reichs counselor or something but, you know, still it's bad enough. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I follow things sort of like in Turkey too, because I, I feel sort of a personal connection uh, to Turkey just because I had a Turkish girlfriend in the 90s. And oh, really? my, my connection to Turkey lasted longer than that relationship did. Uh, <laughs> and so it's sort of depressing to see what's going on. Yeah, it's really yeah. sad. Yeah, although it's, it's heartening to see that the, the younger generation, you know, the polls of the younger generation are sort of, you know, more and more disaffected by Erdogan. Yeah. Um, and what about Egypt? I got think the, yeah. Putin in Russia, and then, you know, even Britain has its, uh, <laughs> has its uh, sort of nationalist stuff going on. You mean right now? Under yeah. The yeah not, not in the same, you know, not to the same, you know. Yeah. Well, I mean, Britain also has a very strong, you know, you know, legal and civil society uh, yes. structure that uh, resists some of that, unlike, you know, unlike Russia. Um, uh, though, though Turkey for a long time was moving in the, you know, in a, the right direction. In fact, yeah. it was moving in the right direction under the AKP party. Um, this P stand for party? You know, is this like ATM machine? But anyway. Um, uh, it was, uh, you know, uh, for a long time, it was moving in the direction of greater civil liberties and civil society and economic freedom and all that stuff. Um, but uh, not so much now. Yeah. Yeah, it's very sad. I think, I think this country will change under a more sensible person. Um, because people do. I mean, people... Public opinion changes quite rapidly, um, both for good and for bad. But I don't know what's going to happen in India or Turkey or Egypt. After all, this the latest round of dictatorship in Egypt is a result of young people clamoring for freedom. I mean, it's in reaction to that. And then Hong Kong, which is yeah, Hong Kong is a tragic case, the most tragic. And a lot of people at the time when it, you know it came under Chinese rule, a lot of people were saying, "Well, look, China has guaranteed it uh, that it'll it'll treat it differently and, treat, and give it freedom." And yeah, well, you know, guarantees from you know from a very powerful government are not always that reliable. Yeah, when I first heard of this of Britain handing back Hong Kong to China and the so-called guarantee of two systems, one nation, I was really skeptical. I don't know what the alternative was, but 
I didn't believe that a communist government would allow Hong Kong to stay free for this long. Yeah, I wasn't that was really being under British control either. Um, and of no. course, Hong Kong has never been you know, exactly a perfect free market. I mean, they don't even have private property and land for the most part. Um, yeah, but they're more free market than almost any other. They oh. were. They're they certainly, certainly more free market than, you know, than uh, the People's Republic of China. <laughs> even though, you know, China's more free market than it was under yeah. Mao, but that's a pretty low bar. Yeah. But don't you think that Hong Kong was more free market than any other country? It's hard Before to say. China. It, was, it was more free market than most. I'll certainly say that. It's, it, it's hard to tell. Once you get to the very top, it's hard to tell because things are you know, more in one respect and less in another. You know, like these debates of whether the United States or Canada is more free market. And people say, well, uh, you know, Canada has a bigger welfare state and higher taxes. But they also have fewer economic regulations uh, in many ways. Same like with Denmark. Denmark has a bigger welfare state than the U.S. Yeah. Higher taxes, but also has fewer regulations. So which one's more free market? I don't know. Um, well, under the British, it had complete freedom of speech, Hong Kong. Yeah. The only thing it didn't have was the vote, which might as might actually have been better for the people. Well, although, you know, obviously, you know, as an anarchist, I'm not a big fan of the, the vote as sort of the, you know, an ideal means of solving things, but it does function as a kind of self-defense. Uh, you know, certainly I think if Hong Kong had a vote now against China, that would, you know, if, you know, it could, if, if people in Hong Kong could vote now on what China's doing to them, I think they'd be better off. Uh, Actually, they do have the vote. And well, they do I, mean, vote again. I mean, if they had, if it were effective, they could vote to vote to China to stop doing something, and it would yeah. stop. Yeah, of that course. Of, you know. The vote can be effective against a communist government. <laughs> yeah. I think libertarianism has a chance. I think we're going to get nationalized healthcare, um, because that's what people want. Most people. Well, I mean, the system that we have now that people call a market system, um, I'm not sure it's really any more free market than a nationalized healthcare system. I think it's just sort of a different flavor. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's a question of, you know, whether, whether it's more direct supervision by the government or whether it's more handed over to, you know, to, um, you know, the medical establishment and private insurance companies and so forth. But you know, in neither case, it's really a free market. That's not really on the- No, it's on not. The table. So yeah, again, you can, and you compare the American system with the Canadian system. Well, you know, one has higher prices. The other one has longer waiting times. It doesn't, yeah. like there's a sharp dividing line of this is, you know, this is more free and this one isn't. Um, you know, but the, it is the case that 40,000 Canadians come to the States every year to seek medical care. Mm -hmm. 40 to 50,000. So it looks like the long lines are worse than the high prices. Oh, maybe it's the insurance that's paying for them. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. Also, I don't know, you know, how, how and I don't know if, uh, you know, if, uh, if Canada offers you know, offers the um, uh, the low cost uh, medical care to non citizens. If it did, then there might be people flowing in the other direction too. The young people. Is that what you said? I said I. I think there would be people. You know, there'd be people from the U.S. going to Canada if if Canada offered. Uh, you know, if Canada offered lower prices. Um, oh. Non well. non Canadian citizens. Uh, I assume. No, because they, they don't have the capacity. And people wouldn't go there regardless because... Well, I, I remember that when, back when George W. Bush was, uh, was president, um, there was this controversy about importing um, Canadian prescription yes. drugs because they were cheap, because they were state subsidized, they were cheaper than... But they were going from here to Canada. And then people wanted to import them back. Yeah, and um, um, 
and anyway, and and Bush was trying to squash this as unfair competition, but you know, sort of, it's, it's unfair competition in both directions because on the one hand, the you know, Canada's low prices were made possible by government intervention, but you know, you could say that the American pharmaceutical uh, industry's high prices are also made possible by government intervention. Um, you now it's complicated. Is it true? One often hears that most of the innovation, most medical innovation takes place here in the States. But I think you have to delete all the, all the, the little tweaks that they make to a drug in order to extend the patent, in order to get a new patent. So I, I think one, we shouldn't count those as innovations at all. Yeah, well, they're, you know, they're innovations in gaming the system, but they're not, you know, they're yeah. not innovations that would be needed uh, in a free market. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, this is a freer market than many places in the world, and there's, and there's a lot of innovation here. But, you know, when I read about, about uh, medical research around the world, I read about stuff happening in... When you read about um, medical what? Medical innovations. Yeah. You know, there's stuff happening here, but also stuff happening in England and uh, Israel and China and various places, various places that are, that are quite different from each other in their legal regimes, but um, uh, there is stuff happening yeah. you know, all over. But don't you think a communist regime makes it impossible for the independent mind to function? <laughs> the, and how was Ayn Rand able to function? <laughs> well, she left when she was 20, 21. Yeah, but she wrote, she wrote several things before she left. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, plus, you know, and a lot of, you know, there, there were a lot of writers and artists, um, you know, sometimes they ended up in Siberia, but um, uh, before they did, they were, you know, they were uh, doing, you know, their minds were clearly functioning. Uh, they're functioning under a, you know, under a threat. But the, what was wrong with the threat wasn't that it made, you know, that it literally froze up their minds and made them incapable of thinking. Um, so, what is um, why have you started this YouTube channel? Because you like to, you like to give lectures. Um, write them down or you like both uh, and I'm, I'm you know pre-recording lectures for my you know for my fall classes uh you know so oh i see okay so, uh, but it's just that I mean, part of it's just that with you now i've now got the you know i've i've now got the technological ability and skills to make youtube videos which uh for a long time either i didn't have the software or i didn't you know know how to do it and now yeah. that I'm, you know, doing these you know these things i can um i can do it it's just, it's just uh kind of fun um and sometimes it's it's you know a lot of love for the ones that aren't interviews the ones that are just um me talking about stuff uh you know it's, it's sometimes less work to just talk about something that I actually write it up um and uh you know, you know, some people would prefer to read something than to than to uh, watch a video. Other people prefer to watch a video rather than read something, and you know, I can cater to both. But also, then this chance to do interviews with people, I think, is uh, is just going to be fun. This certainly has been. Well, on that note, I I don't know if I have any other questions. Okay. Any any final thoughts? Uh, no, thank you very much. Um, um, good luck on your new venture. All right, thanks. Okay, Roderick, bye. Bye-bye.